Hi, everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us this afternoon. Uh, I'm Alex Vettis, and I just wanted to start by introducing uh, our symposia as speakers today. So we're going to be talking about the role of caregivers in interventions for youth depression and suicidality. Uh, first, oh. nope, sorry, not used to using a PC. Oh, here we go. Okay. So first, uh, we'll be hearing from Dr. Kirsty Clark. Dr. Clark um, is a psychiatric epidemiologist at Vanderbilt University, and she'll be talking about parent responses to their sexual and gender minority children, implications for parent-focused supportive interventions. Next, I will share um, some preliminary work on the development of a digital health intervention uh, for caregivers of high-risk youth who have presented to the emergency department setting. Next, we'll hear from Dr. Autumn Kujawa, who's an assistant professor in psychology and human development at Vanderbilt, and she'll be talking about uh, promoting positive emotions in mother-child relationships to reduce depression risk in children and adolescents. And then last but not least, we'll hear from Dr. Jessica Schwartzman, an assistant professor in the psychiatry department at BUMC. And she will be talking about exploring parent and adolescent outcomes during autism adaptive CBT for depression in autistic adolescents. Uh, so we'll go ahead and get started with Dr. Clark. Okay, um, thanks so much for having me today. Um, so like Dr. Bettis mentioned, I'll be talking about parent responses to their sexual and gender minority children and implications for parent-focused supportive interventions. And this is work that I conducted with my colleagues at Yale as well as at the University of Maryland. And I have no conflicts of interest to disclose and here's some of my funding info. So just to start off with some background, we know that LGBTQ plus youth experience substantially elevated risk for suicide and other severe adverse mental health difficulties, including depression and anxiety. So this is just showing you data from the YRBS, the Youth Risk Behavior Survey, um, which is the largest national survey of high schoolers in the US. And so you can see here that this is comparing transgender teens in yellow to lesbian, gay, and bisexual teens in the red and to heterosexual teens in the blue. And we can sort of surmise that a vast majority of those heterosexual teens are also cisgender. And so you can see there across all outcomes that the LGBTQ plus teens are vastly overrepresented among those reporting persistent feelings of sadness or hopelessness, considering attempting suicide, making a suicide plan, attempting suicide, and making a serious suicide attempt. And so why do LGBTQ plus youth experience these disparities in suicide risk and related outcomes? Well, minority stress theory is the principal theory used to help us understand these disparities in risk. And briefly, minority stress theory posits that LGBTQ plus folks and LGBTQ plus youth are exposed to distal external stressors, such as discrimination, rejection from parents, and stigmatizing laws and policies. And these distal stressors then work to produce negative internal psychological processes that are considered proximal stressors, like expectations of rejection, concealment, and the internalization of stigma. And together, these work together um, to promote adverse mental health outcomes, such as suicide risk. And so we know that a key distal stressor affecting LGBTQ plus youth is parental rejection. So this is a figure that John Pachankas and I uh, developed showcasing the breadth of parental rejection for LGBTQ plus youth. So on the left there in the uh, yellow part of the umbrella, you can see direct interpersonal rejection. This is probably what you think of when you think of parental rejection. So things like verbal rejection, assault, um, belittling, name calling, um, as well as uh, physical abuse and violence. But you can see for LGBTQ plus youth, the extent of parental rejection also includes things like restricting access to gender-affirming care for trans youth, um, kicking a youth out of the house. 
exclusion from social and community support, as well as shame-driven rejection, like enrolling one's child in conversion therapy. And we know from the literature that all of these forms of parental rejection are associated with severe adverse mental health outcomes, while conversely, we know that support from parents is associated with positive mental health outcomes. But despite this, there's few parent-focused supportive interventions specifically for parents of LGBTQ plus youth. And those that do exist, many have, uh, or most, have not been evaluated in randomized controlled trials. In fact, most existing interventions to improve LGBTQ plus youth mental health um, target at the individual level. So target the youth's coping skills, which we know are, are really important, but it doesn't get to the root cause of parental rejection. Common approaches you might have seen are things like bibliotherapy and peer-led parent support groups like PFLAG, Mama Dragons, the Gay Christian Network. Um, and there is the Family Acceptance Project, which is run by Caitlin Ryan, and this is psychoeducational and a training hub for parents of LGBTQ plus youth, but it remains to be tested in a randomized controlled trial. And a real question that we're left with is what support or interventions might help shift parents from these rejecting behaviors to acceptance? Like I mentioned, there's scant studies assessing interventions or therapies for parents of LGBTQ plus youth. And so there's no clear consensus about uh, key therapeutic strategies or considerations for implementation of such interventions. And so until, until this uh, current study, to our knowledge, no studies had asked parents or caregivers of LGBTQ plus youth what they might desire, what they might need in a supportive intervention. So this leads us to some questions. Well, how does the desire and need for parenting interventions differ depending on the parent's relationship with their LGBTQ plus child or their level of support for their child? And how can we tailor parenting interventions to uniquely and specifically support parents of LGBTQ plus youth to ultimately improve the child's mental health outcomes? So in terms of the specific research questions, we were interested in studying from the perspective of parents themselves, what parenting intervention types, modalities, and content could help to support parents of LGBTQ plus youth and do parents' perspectives on these interventions differ in their level of support for their child? So I'll talk through the method. So in terms of the inclusion criteria, we enrolled parents with an LGBTQ plus child younger than 30 years old. We used a, an array of online ads, listservs, and community flyers. And this was for an anonymous web-based survey. The topics of the survey included um, parent-child relationship questions, questions about the child's mental health, as well as um, parents' views on intervention and services desire. And in total, we enrolled 205 heterosexual cisgender parents. So in terms of the sample characteristics, to remind you, this is parents completing surveys about themselves and their child. So on average, parents were 47 years old, most were white mothers. Nearly two-thirds had completed college, and three-quarters um, considered themselves affiliated with a religion. And parents reported that on average their child was 19 years old, that they had come out to their parents at around 16 years of age. Um, about 58% of the children were gay or lesbian, followed by a little over 20% as bisexual. Slightly more than half were assigned female sex at birth, and about 40% were trans or gender diverse. And aligned with previous research, we saw a high prevalence of reports of um, over one quarter of the youth had experienced frequent depressive symptoms in the past six months, and nearly 40% had experienced frequent anxiety symptoms in the last six months. And so just to orient you on how I'm going to explain the current findings, in a previous study, uh, we identified three distinct subgroups of parents in this sample based on how accepting they were towards their LGBTQ child. We found that about 15% of this sample um, were negative, indicating low acceptance, whereas nearly three quarters were positive, indicating high acceptance, and about one in 10 had a more mixed or ambivalent response to their child. And I just provide this information because in the current study, we stratified all of the findings by these um, parent responses to their child, by these subgroups. 
I won't go into the method of this work. This is presented in a previous uh, study that you can read here. But as I go forth, um, all of the findings that I'll present are stratified by these parent subgroups. So in the current study, as I mentioned, all analyses were stratified by negative, mixed, and positive response to assess differences between parent subgroups. First, I'm going to describe um, parenting intervention desire, willingness, and preferred treatment modalities stratified by parent subgroup. And then I'll talk through some qualitative content to think uh, towards identifying potential treatment targets and content for future parenting interventions. So in terms of the results, so for the graphs I'm going to show you, let's just focus on the largest color blocks for each of the parent groups. So you can see there that the left-hand side column is negative parents, parents who respond negatively to their child's sexual orientation or gender identity. In the middle are the mixed response parents, and on the right-hand side are the positive response parents. So for the question, would you be interested in receiving services to help you cope with your child's LGBTQ status or to improve your relationship with your LGBTQ child, we see that the largest proportion of the negative response parents have that yellow color block, which is probably yes, um, showing that this group is probably interested in receiving services. The mixed group in the middle, the largest color block is the red, indicating probably not. And then we see a more mix of the positive response parents. When we asked, would you want your child involved in treatment or intervention with you, for the negative and positive response parents, they tended to respond po possibly. I might want my child um, involved in treatment with me. Well, the highest proportion of the mixed response or ambivalent parents said no, I would not want my child involved with me in treatment. In terms of the desired number and duration of parenting intervention services, this was a select all that apply question. And you can see there that the uh, green column are negative response parents, the red are mixed response, and the blue are positive response. And so negative response parents tended to say that they'd be willing to attend up to four sessions, which I thought was pretty good. Um, we saw more of a distribution with those positive parents with 30% stating they'd be willing to attend up to 12. And then with those mixed response parents, we saw that the highest proportion said, I'd just be willing to attend one session. In terms of the duration of sessions willing to attend, we saw that all three groups desired about an hour in length as compared to an hour and a half or two hours. And the last sort of descriptive finding here was about parents' desired modality for receiving parenting intervention services. And so you can see here, this again was check all that apply, and they had several options, including meeting with a therapist in person, meeting with a therapist in a group setting, so group therapy, meeting with a therapist over video conferencing, like Zoom, uh, doing group therapy over Zoom, and then last, more just self-directed, viewing online video modules and resources without a therapist interaction. And so the green block here refers to the negative parents. And we were surprised to see that the largest proportion of these negative response parents said, you know what, I, I, would, like, I would be okay with meeting with a therapist in person or meeting with a therapist um, in person in a group setting. The largest proportion of the mixed response parents said, I just want to do these online video modules. I don't want to have a therapist interaction. And the blue group is the positive parents who also said that the largest proportion said that they would prefer self-guided videos. And this is perhaps because they perceive that everything's fine, so there's no need for parent involved or for therapist involvement. So I want to move on to describing some of the qualitative data. And here we just had an open-ended response question that was please describe your relationship with your child in a couple of sentences. The a priori research objective here was to see how different groups of parents responded to this question to identify potential treatment targets for future parenting interventions related to the parent-child relationship. And we conducted these analyses with a thematic analysis with a top-down approach. And I want to remind you as I go through showing you some of the quotes from parents that we did not ask them to specifically discuss their child's sexual orientation or gender identity or how it affected them. We simply asked them, please describe your relationship with your child in a couple of sentences. And again, I'll present these data stratified by parent group. 
So in terms of the um, codes that we found that emerged from the negative parental response group, of which there was a 75% response rate to this question, parents in this group wrote about the direct recognition of their child's LGBTQ status as a root problem of the parent-child issues. One parent said, I feel guilty and ashamed about my child's sexual orientation. I think it's very hard for me as a parent to accept and adapt to my child's identity. Parents in this negative response group tended to discuss conflict between their personal beliefs and their child's LGBTQ status. One parent said, I feel nervous all the time. My personality and my deep inner belief will never match up with my child's sexual lifestyle. Parents in this group wrote about feeling ill-prepared. They needed or wanted more time, more education, and more understanding. One parent said, I feel overwhelmed all the time because I don't have enough expertise to deal with my child's sexual orientation. Unfortunately, parents in this group tended to place the onus of responsibility of the parent-child relationship issues onto their child. Um, I think this quote really saliently addresses that. One, this parent said, I'm totally ashamed of him and his behaviors inside our family. He also excludes himself from any family events. In general, parents in this group um, openly discussed distress, talked about negative feelings like shame and guilt, and used a lot of I statements. In terms of a you know, hopeful code that emerged, was this code that we named Fostering Hope, where some parents did talk about that they believed in a better future. So for instance, one parent said, we're currently in a cold war, but I believe we still love each other. Things will get better. And last, parents in this group raised their child's mental health difficulties as an issue, but you can see from this quote um, that there's some cause and effect here, with one parent writing, I hate his sexual orientation and he suffers from depression. In terms of um, open-ended responses from the mixed uh, group, or these parents who are more ambivalent, we saw a lower response rate um, from this group in general to this question. But parents in this group discussed how their relationship with their child was strained either now or in the past. Uh, one participant said, my child and I have a very strained relationship. I would like to think that we are close. Parents tended to talk about the distance in their relationship, but wanting more closeness, kind of like reflected in that prior quote. One parent said, me and my child are close, but we could be closer. She doesn't talk a lot, and I wonder why God does things, but I choose to continue following the path to see what happens. I think that this code um, really is salient in terms of this mixed or like ambivalent response group, where parents tended to separate their child's LGBTQ status from the parent-child relationship or minimize their child's identity altogether, with one parent saying, fully support her, not thrilled with her being gay, but love her to pieces. And last, parents in this group tended to not mention parent-child relationship issues at all, or just wrote positive general statements um, with little explanation, like life is great. And last, in terms of the positive parent response codes, unsurprisingly, this group had the highest response rate, and they also wrote the most words. Parents wanted to talk about their positive relationship and how they'd learned to accept their child. For this, I'm not gonna read individual quotes because there was just so much data, but instead just present um, some of the codes for this group, which were things like unconditional positive regard, boundaries and respect and healthy attachment. Parents did in this group did talk about feeling worried or concerned um, for their child and for what their child might face from the, from the world. Parents often talked about hiding their own feelings or their true feelings from their child to make sure that their child felt accepted, loved, and supported. Uh, parents in this group did talk about some relationship issues or stressors, but these seemed developmentally normative and not really related to the child's identity. Parents in this group were active in LGBTQ plus organizations. They talked about walking the journey together. They often recognized difficulties in the past or in the present with accepting their child and saw their relationship as a work in progress. And helpfully for us, they also oftentimes offered explanation for how they learned to accept their child, often through things like psychoeducation or support groups. Um, and many parents in general talked about their relationship improving since their child came out. 
And so before I end or move into implications, I want to just ground us in the present moment right now with anti-LGBTQ legislation sweeping the U.S., especially in the U.S. South, where I'm based. And so this is a news search from yesterday. I don't know if you can see that very well, but it shows some of the top stories, including anti-transgender youth bills in Tennessee and Texas, as well as don't say gay laws and sports restriction laws across the U.S. And as part of another study I've been working on, I've been interviewing parents of LGBTQ youth in the South, and I found this quote from a mom of a non-binary child that I spoke with just a few days ago really striking, and I wanted to share it with you all. She said in talking about being part of the study and uh, intervention, most of the other parents of LGBTQ plus youth that I talked to were like, mm -mm, I'm not doing that study right now because like, I don't know who's gonna get that information and if that's gonna eventually mean a knock from DCF, you know? So that, that I think is the other thing that is very real in a lot of our minds, especially people with trans kids is you know, what that means if you would ask me to even think about this being true or something that we'd even be talking about six months ago, I would have told you you were crazy. So I don't know what to like think because I'm not sure what will end up, how much crazier it could possibly get. And I think this really highlights how difficult it is right now in the present moment to engage parents of LGBTQ kids in research and in intervention, um, given the socio-political context, despite how much this is needed. So I'll just end with some conclusions. I know I have about 40 seconds left, so I'm gonna speed through these. Um, so in terms of the takeaways, uh, this is the first known mixed method study to identify intervention targets among parents of LGBTQ plus youth by studying parents themselves. We identified stark differences as well as some similarities between parent subgroups in terms of intervention preferences and descriptions of the relationship. And this highlights targets for tailored interventions to meet the unique needs of parents who vary in their level of support of their child. Um, I won't talk about all of these intervention implications, but we do have a paper coming out soon on this that hopefully you all uh, will read because I'm out of time. But thank you um, for listening and I'm excited to take any questions. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so today I'm going to be talking about the preliminary development of a digital health intervention to support caregivers of high-risk youth and specifically uh, caregivers of youth when they present to our emergency department with a psychiatric emergency. And I want to start by um, acknowledging that this work is supported by funding from the Klingenstein Third Generation Foundation with secondary support from NIMH, and I don't have any conflicts of interest to disclose. So let's start with the scope of the problem. We know that over the past several decades, we have seen uh, a steady increase in the numbers of youth who are coming into our emergency departments with a primary behavioral health or psychiatric concern. This was true both prior to the pandemic and also during the pandemic. And in fact, early on in the pandemic, recent data has shown that while overall rates of kids who came into the emergency department declined uh, for some obvious reasons, the proportion of those visits that were specific to mental health actually rose. Uh, in addition, we see kids coming into the emergency department primarily for suicidality, but not just for that. So uh, physicians in the emergency department are seeing a really broad range of beh behavioral health problems from suicide risk to aggression to anxiety um, with a lot of other things in between. We also know that emergency departments were not designed to serve uh, mental health. That is not their goal and that is not really their function. Um, so it's not always the most welcoming environment when families approach an emergency department in a psychiatric emergency. In addition, we know that a lot of these families will get discharged home. Um, so a good proportion of youth will come in and be assessed and it will be determined that they don't need to be admitted to the hospital or to a psychiatric uh, inpatient facility, but they are safe to go home and they're recommended to connect with outpatient services. 
However, we know that many of these youth will never get connected to outpatient care. Um, there are a lot of reasons that this can happen. There are really long wait times involved when you leave the hospital and get on a wait list and you don't get care for six weeks. Uh, sometimes it can start to feel a little bit hopeless, maybe a little bit frustrating because it's really hard to find good care. Um, care is expensive uh, in addition to being unavailable. And so for many of these families, the emergency department is both their first contact with a mental health uh, physician if the emergency department does have the luxury of having someone with that expertise involved, um, and they won't go on to get connected to solid outpatient care that can keep them from coming back into the emergency department for these same types of problems. Now there are some interventions that have been developed specifically for the emergency department setting. Um, so safety planning, the family intervention for suicide prevention, these were all, the, are, they're great interventions uh, and hopefully are, are popping up in more and more emergency departments across the US. Um, but they are all single session interventions that are designed to be delivered in the emergency department. They are all focused specifically on suicidality and they all, for the most part, really heavily focus on the adolescent, um, but kind of leave out the caretaker piece. And so I personally have done a fair amount of clinical work in the inpatient setting, worked with social workers and physicians in our emergency department, uh, as well as seeing these kids after they've been in the emergency department. And the question that kept coming up for me is what about their caregivers? We are really missing an opportunity to support the caregivers, and yet at the same time, when they leave the emergency department, they have a huge task at hand. We ask caregivers to be responsible for making sure that their child stays safe, but we don't give them a lot of tools in those moments um, to be able to do that. And so that is the uh, question that I am hoping to address uh, or the gap that I'm hoping to fill in the development of a new digital health tool. Uh, and so that's what I'm gonna be talking mostly about today is some preliminary work that's going to inform the development of this intervention. Um, so the intervention, the shorthand for it is IP, so the Intervention for Parent Education After Care, About Care After the ED. This is a mentored grant, so I just want to uh, start by acknowledging that I wrote this grant when I was on fellowship at Brown under the fantastic mentorship of Dr. Megan Ranney and Dr. Tony Spirito. Uh, I then moved the grant with me to Vanderbilt Medical Center where I got to pick up two more wonderful mentors. So Dr. Meg Benningfield and Dr. Adam Kujawa, who's here today, um, have all been really instrumental in helping this uh, work move forward. So why did we think that this would best be suited as a digital health tool or digital health intervention? We were really thinking about several different pieces. First, sort of the context of the emergency department itself. It's not a place that people are then coming back to for after care. And a lot of families that come into the emergency room at Vanderbilt are coming from a far way away. So we're seeing people coming in from Alabama, from Kentucky, um, you know, driving two, three hours to get this care. It's not reasonable or feasible to ask them to come back for follow-up visits at the hospital. And that's just not what the emergency department is designed for. So we really we're thinking about something that would be highly accessible to the families that we see in our emergency department, that would be flexible for these families, that would be something that they could potentially do in their own time, and that would be scalable. We really are hoping to build a tool that could be transported to other emergency departments across the U.S. and adapted to fit the needs of those particular settings. So with the intervention in mind, before, when we wrote the grant, we had an idea of what we thought we might want to include and what we, the literature suggests might be important for these parents. Uh, the first thing that we were thinking about is building self-efficacy skills. So can we build parents' competence and, competence and confidence in managing their child's mental health during these acute crisis periods? Emotion regulation skills, so we know that as a parent, seeing your child in crisis is extremely distressing for you as a parent. So can we help you better manage your emotions as you're trying to facilitate getting support for your child? And then lastly, we really had the goal in mind of this being a tool that's not in and of itself going to uh, be an intervention targeting parents' mental health, but that it's going to help them better facilitate um, getting their kids into care and navigate what is often an extremely frustrating and confusing mental health care system. 
Um, so this is what we had in mind, but we really wanted to talk to parents and learn more from them about what it is that they do or don't want and what are the unique struggles that this group of parents are facing. So the first part of this project and the data I'll be sharing today comes from qualitative interviews that we did with 13 parents. Um, these were parents that had visited the VUMC Children's Hospital emergency room within the past month with their child for a, a primary behavioral health concern. Um, there were no restrictions around what that was, so kids were presenting for suicidality, for aggression. We had one uh, parent whose child um, had symptoms of psychosis, so there was a lot of different presentations within the kids that were coming into the hospital. Um, we were we enrolled 13 moms, so we tried really, really hard to uh, not just enroll women in this study, but we had a really hard time with that. So our final sample did end up being 100% women. Um, we did get a fairly broad age range of parents, so our youngest parent was 21 years old and our oldest was 48. Um, the sample was predominantly white. Uh, and educational background spanned from high school degree to a doctoral degree um, and hit kind of everything in between. And then in terms of annual income, the lowest reported annual income per household was $5,000 a year. The highest was over $150,000 a year. So we conducted these interviews. They were about an hour long each. They were all audio recorded and we had a few um, goals in mind when we did these interviews. So we wanted to hear from parents more broadly about their experiences uh, with the mental health system. And then we wanted to hear from them about their experience leading up to coming into the emergency department with their child, what it was like in the ED for them, how the discharge process played out, and then what happened afterwards and what they would like after they left. Um, what I'm going to be focusing on today is what they shared with us about their discharge experience and the time afterwards because that is directly going to feed into the intervention that we're going to be building. And so once we uh, completed those interviews, they were audio recorded and transcribed and then we developed a coding manual um, that um, it was fairly comprehensive in covering all the things that we targeted in the interview. And I want to share some of the themes that we extracted from that coding. So one thing that came out uh, was this disconnect at the time of their emergency room discharge. So feeling like the discharge itself was confusing or what they thought they were told when they left and then what they tried to do once they left didn't quite match up and they were left feeling frustrated and confused. All parents clearly described that there was a significant impact uh, on their own mental health as well as on these practical pieces of their life like being able to hold a job uh, and their financial status. Parents shared an overwhelming need for social support and feeling like they didn't have a community that they could rely on for support specifically around their child's mental health as well as a need for practical resources. And then they all talked about some stigma related, feeling like there was stigma related to their child's mental health. So I'm going to share some quotes that parents um, said to us during the interview that I think really highlight all of these themes pretty well. So in terms of the disconnect at the time of discharge, one parent said, the lady in the ED was like, hey, if there's any problem over the weekend or if you need something else, you call this number. So I called this number and I got nowhere and was told to come back to the emergency department. That was not helpful at all. Another parent said, but the discharge was a little bit weird in that I didn't feel any closure, and so I almost thought that, did they discharge with my child? Did they give her some debriefing and I missed it when I stepped out? Did I miss it when I went to get the snack? Um, and I highlight this not to be highly critical of our emergency department colleagues, because I know that they are under immense stress and doing a fantastic job. But what I think this shows is that for these parents, most of them described being in the emergency department for five to 12 hours. They were tired, they hadn't eaten or slept. And so if information was shared with them, it's not shared in a way that it is useful to them and that they're able to process it and remember what's shared with them. Or in the rush of everything, they might not have gotten a lot of information. And so there's some sort of disconnect here um, that parents need more information at this critical point. 
In terms of their own mental health, one parent said, it's exhausting, I can tell you right now. Since October of last year, I'm constantly fighting, constantly battling. I mean, I'm trying to get help for myself. I'm trying to put my oxygen mask on first. I'm doing this, that, and the other, but it's absolutely exhausting. So this parent used an analogy that I think many of us therapists have often used with parents, which is you've got to put your oxygen mask on first before you can help your child. And what these parents overwhelmingly described to us is that it's really hard to do just that, and this is taking an immense toll on me as I'm using everything that I can do to keep my child safe. In addition, on the practical side of things, parents describe that it's really difficult to um, manage both their child's mental health uh, and the needs that that required, as well as holding a job. And I should say that all of these uh, interviews were conducted during COVID, where a lot of the time school was being done at home and parents are trying to go to work. And, and what that does when you're trying to monitor your child's safety is it, it makes things really complicated. So uh, one parent said, but yes, yeah, so my ability to hold a normal job right now is very light. And so I thought if I need to cut back and take a financial hit and do this for a couple of years to see her live and get older, then this is what I need to do. With regard to stigma, so parents described feeling like it was not okay to talk about what their child was going through and what the family was going through with regard to their child's mental health. So one parent said, well, I mean, one of the big, big things about kids' mental health is that people are very quiet about it. Another parent said, we even have to be sensitive about that with our own families because we are breaking. They're like, I don't understand why you have to. None of the kids need therapy. Um, one parent described that this same child much earlier in life had um, been diagnosed with uh, and treated for cancer and compared the experience that that family had in the hospital the first time their child was hospitalized for this medical condition and the second time for a psychiatric condition and how um, different those experiences were that suddenly, uh, you know, their first experience was that everybody kind of rolled out the red carpet for them. Everything was taken care of for them. Appointments were made. People made them food, made sure that they could focus all of their energy on their child. The second time around, they were given a piece of paper and told to call and make an appointment on their own. And just how different that is and how stigmatizing that must feel for parents felt really salient in that uh, example. In addition, parents talked about really wanting support and wanting community um, and wanting to know that they're not alone. So one mom said, I don't know how other parents feel, but it's very isolating living life for the child like this. I've lost all my friends and family members. I get it. People don't want to be around it because it sucks. So then I want to share some of the things that came out when we explicitly asked them, okay, if we were to uh, enroll you in an intervention or a resource that came to your phone, whether it's text messaging based or app based, um, when you left the emergency department, what are some things that you would like? What would you use? And some consistent things came out from parents. Parents said they want real-time resources, they want concrete tailored suggestions, they want these resources to be, to be available over the long term. They, they wanted more information about what their child was going through or what we would call psychoeducation. And then they shared a little bit about their preferences for format and frequency. So I'll give some examples of, of this. I thought this quote really captured um, the need for real-time resources. So a parent said, but I think the most helpful thing would be knowing that I could get in touch with someone, but not the robot kind of form and not someone in a different time zone halfway around the world. It's at that moment to be like my daughter's threatening to kill herself and saying she doesn't see hope for tomorrow. We've already been to the ER. What is something I can say or what should my next step be? In terms of psychoeducation or information, a parent shared, you all that are in this kind of world every day probably have a lot of tips. It's like I teach people how to save money and I think everyone knows how to do this. What I constantly hear is, oh, I've never been taught that before. As physicians, one might assume, well, everyone knows this because this is our basic currency of information. Well, you know what, in the moment we probably don't. So I think recognizing that for, again, in this context, many parents and many families that come into the emergency department have never talked with a mental health provider before that moment and they really don't have have a baseline knowledge of how they're supposed to do this, how they're supposed to navigate this. And we should always assume that of parents rather than assuming that they uh, know this world that we all live in all the time. 
In terms of concrete tailored suggestions, one parent said it'll say was describing a um, a different app that this parent really liked for uh, weight management, and I think spent probably half of the, her hour long interview talking about this app in particular, and said. Um, it'll say something like, what do you think would be most helpful for you today? And I might say listening to music or getting steps in or trying new food. And then the next click over, it kind of guides your reader to what is most helpful for them. So it might be the same thing in, mental health, in the mental health world. What is your struggle today? So really getting at um, not just saying call 911, not just saying check in on your child, but really getting specific about things that they can do. Uh, because those general suggestions um, are not super helpful in the heat of the moment when they don't don't have those foundational skills. And in terms of format and frequency, uh, this was a pretty consistent theme. So this parent said, I think it would be annoying to have it all in a message, or I think it would be annoying to get more than once a week or a couple times a week if you're really in the thick of things. So there was this sort of balance between parents really describing that there was a lot of resources that they wanted, but also we don't want to get flooded with information. We don't want to be bothered too much because we already have a lot on our plate. Um, so as we move forward into testing or developing and testing the tool, it's something that we're going to um, hopefully be getting a lot of feedback as we go to figure out kind of what that sweet spot is. And then in terms of the long-term availability of resources, um, this parent just described wanting basically to be able to revisit this, um, kind of having it available um, both in the crisis moment but also looking ahead two, three, four months from now if something pops up again, being able to revisit it um, would be really helpful. And I'm mindful of time, so I'm going to try to move a little bit faster. Uh, so some of the things that they said that would get in the way for them, we wanted to know what would stop them from using it, what would keep them from using it, or what would they not want. Um, and three things uh, primarily came up in these conversations. One is concern about privacy. Second is concern about stigma of using a tool like this. And the third was related to accessibility. So in terms of privacy, this parent said, I'm sure privacy would be number one, both in terms of if I submit a question, if I put anything in here, is that going to come back to hurt me? Is that going to be detrimental to my child? Is that going to go somewhere on their record? So we have to be really thoughtful as we implement or design and implement these tools, especially anything that's tied to the hospital system, and be really forth coming with these parents about what will and won't go into their medical record or their child's medical record. Um, and that is a very valid concern. They don't want to submit something that could come back um, and be damaging to them in some way. In terms of stigma, when parents said, then also I know especially if I felt like my child were to see me on the app, even just the design of the app or the name of the app, making sure that it's not like suicide prevention parents or something. So they don't want someone to look at their phone and know what they're doing. They don't want their child maybe to look at it and see that, or someone in the community. So being thoughtful about how we design this so that they do feel like they have that privacy, um, both in terms of what's happening with their information, but also when they're using the app. And then in terms of accessibility, one parent um, described in most of the articles that are written in doctor speak, so it's above my pay grade anyway, so I can get through some of it, but most of it is too complex and it doesn't really help. So really designing something that's going to be accessible at all education levels for parents and not assuming that they have some baseline knowledge about healthcare or about mental health, making sure it's understandable. So, um, just some key takeaways to wrap up. We know that these parents are really struggling and they are doing the best that they can with what they have. So it's really on us as providers to, to be offering more support to these parents and figuring out ways that we can do a better job of supporting them in this really critical period after they've come in to our emergency room with a crisis. Um, and then resources need to be specific. They need to be tailored and readily accessible. We really need to help parents understand that they're not alone in this. We know this. We see these parents all the time. We know that lots and lots of parents are coming in and experiencing the same things. But these parents don't necessarily know that. They don't feel like that. They feel like they really are alone. Um, we need to do a better job of uh, hopefully helping build skills in these parents to support their own mental health and well-being. And we need to be giving them more information. Um, 
So I am right up against time, so I'll just say for the next steps in this process, we're working on building out a text messaging based tool that we're going to iteratively test. So we're going to have cohorts of five parents at a time go through it and both give us real time feedback over a course of four weeks, as well as then do interviews at the end to provide feedback. And we'll uh, make adjustments as we go and hopefully then be able to do a larger pilot trial of this. So thank you. Um, for listening, thank you to everyone who's been involved in this project, especially the parents that did the interviews. Uh, and I probably have time for maybe a question before we move to the next person. Oh, yeah. Um, I have a question about what you think about either one parent using it versus both parents. Um, obviously, not everybody. Yeah, that's a great question. So if anybody didn't hear, the question was about whether this could be accessible to multiple caregivers in a household and the implications of only having women contribute feedback at this stage. So I do, our goal as we test it is that any caregiver in the home um, would be allowed to test that and give feedback. I, and I think our big goal is to get a bit more diverse in a number of ways as we pilot test um, this program. There, um, I don't have a great explanation for why we were only successful at getting moms. Um, in terms of uh, thinking about diversity in a much broader way, um, the way we were able to access parents and the way that the emergency room is structured at Vanderbilt is a little bit complicated and kind of, um, there's a different system where kids, uh, at, kids who are on Medicare go through a totally different assessment process where we're, we actually as Vanderbilt providers can't access that uh, service. And so it really cuts off, uh, I think, an important group of families in this. Um, so as we move forward to testing it, that won't keep us from potentially approaching those families for um, testing out the app. So we're hoping to be able to get kind of a broader picture across um, kind of all aspects of demographics. All right, Autumn, you're up next. All right, hi everyone. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit today about my work on trying to promote positive emotions in mother-child relationships um, to reduce depression risk. And it's taking a little bit of different perspective um, from the first couple of talks in terms of trying to use neuroscience research and what we see related to vulnerability for depression in kids and then translate that to the development of an intervention. So I'm gonna start with some background on what we know about neural processes in children at high risk for depression and then I'll share some preliminary work on inter an intervention we've been developing. So I, know, I don't have any financial interests and conflicts to disclose, but this work um, was funded in part by a few different organizations. So as I mentioned, I'm gonna start by talking about the role of reward responsiveness in depression risk and focus particularly in measuring reward responsiveness at the neural level and looking at brain function with EEG, which I'll talk a little bit more about. And then talking about the role of caregivers in shaping reward responses and how the social context is so relevant for understanding positive emotions and reward processing. And then talking a little bit about limitations of our existing interventions for changing reward responses and relatedly positive affect, more of the positive emotions. And I'll show some preliminary data on an intervention we've been developing called Family Promoting Positive Emotions. So as I said, I tend to use a lot of neural measures in my work. I think that they are really helpful for providing insight into early emerging vulnerabilities for psychopathology, particularly depression, and giving us insight into what's happening beyond what we can get from self-report and behavioral measures. In particular, I do a lot of work with event-related potentials, which are derived from the electroencephalogram, EEG. Um, and these are really nice neural measures because they have high temporal resolution. We have a lot of evidence of support for their reliability for repeated assessments across development, even starting early on in 
um, infants, and those are my children when they were much younger participating in EEG studies. Um, they're also relatively economical and accessible, so could potentially be integrated into clinical assessment or clinical settings for assessment and treatment planning. So I'm going to focus today on a specific component of the EEG called the reward positivity that's reflect, that reflects a reward-related signal in the brain thought to be related to reinforcement learning processes and correlated with activation of the ventral striatum and medial prefrontal cortex circuits that we know are really relevant to reward processing. And so the way that this component looks, um, so this is... Um, the ERP wave, and so this is segmenting the EEG in response to reward feedback and averaging across trials, and we see that we get a series of negative and positive deflections emerging across time, and this is at a millisecond scale, so we're looking at these really early emerging neural processes. And so this is the typical response we see when people are told that they win money. And then this is the difference when people, this is how it looks when people are told that they lose money. And you can see, um, I don't have my cursor to show you, um, but you can see around 300 milliseconds, those two signals start to diverge, and that's this reward positivity component. So it's really early emerging, very um, um, sort of automatic processing of reward. And then we see it reflected over the scalp, over frontal central sites. And so we've done a lot of work to basic research on the reward positivity to see how we elicit it in different types of tasks, how it changes across development. We find that it's reliably elicited in response to both social and monetary feedback. Um, so one way that we elicit it in response to social feedback is a task where we tell um, children and adolescents that they're playing a game with other peers and they have to make decisions, they learn more and more about each other and they have to vote each other in and out of the task. And in the context of, of that game, the participant gets a series of um, positive acceptance feedback and rejection feedback and we find that that elicits this reward positivity. But it's also very commonly studied in monetary reward tasks. So like a monetary incentive delay task where we give people a cue indicating they may win a reward if they press a button as quickly as, if they press a button quick enough, and then they receive monetary reward and loss feedback indicating they're winning small amounts of money or losing small amounts of money. So we can use this measure in this way to look at reward processing in different domains and across development and to give us insight into a more sort of objective indicator of reward responsiveness. So I'm gonna quickly highlight some of the prior work that's kind of motivated this interest in intervention. So first, a number of years ago for my dissertation research, I showed that we actually see a redu reduced reward positivity in children of mothers with histories of depression with, that's independent of child's own symptoms. And this is in children who have yet to develop a depressive episode themselves, but around by, at least by age nine or so, they're showing blunted reward responsiveness as measured by this reward positivity particularly in when moms have a history of pure depression, so not comorbid depression and anxiety, but pure depression, which we think may be um, characterized often by anhedonia and sort of a lack of engagement in social interactions. And things. We also see that it's moderated, this effect is moderated by early parenting behavior, so that when moms have a history of depression, if they also show more authoritative parenting or showed more authoritative parenting early in childhood at age three, so including more warmth, structure, support, then the offspring have, children have relatively intact reward processing, whereas we see that blunted reward response specifically in children who have both a risk for depression and their moms exhibited lower positive authoritative parenting, less, less warmth, support, and structure early on. So this is really interesting because it suggests that the social, social context and social interactions really set the foundation for the development of reward processing and positive valence systems in the brain and behavior. It also suggests, though, that this effect of maternal depression might be altered then by changing parenting and parent-child relationships. And that's really a core foundation of the intervention work I'm going to talk about. And then we also see that this component prospectively predicts later depressive symptoms. So this is looking at children from age 9 and following them up across time to age 12. And we see that kids who show that blunted reward responsiveness 
through, reflected in this ERP component at age nine are, show higher levels of depressive symptoms at age 12, accounting for age nine depressive symptoms, so really predicting changes in development of symptoms across time. So that suggests to us that this is something important in terms of an early emerging risk factor and something to potentially target through intervention. And if we can change reward responsiveness, we might be able to prevent the later development of depression or at least reduce the severity of later depression. Now, so that raises the question then of how do we change reward responsiveness? And um, what we know is that it doesn't seem to change with traditional CBT for depression. And this is consistent with evidence with positive affect, that CBT is more effective for decreasing negative affect than it is for increasing positive affect. And that makes sense knowing kind of the components and what we tend to focus on with traditional CBT. And so in a sample, this is a small sample of adolescents with depression, um, they were treated with group CBT, a really intensive 16 session group CBT, and they completed EEGs pre and post CBT. We actually saw that the reward positivity decreased overall, which was pretty surprising, it might just be from repeating the task and maybe being less engaging with a second administration. But Adolescents who showed a relative increase in the reward positivity with a CBT showed more of a decrease in symptoms of depression and anhedonia. So that suggests that even though CBT doesn't tend to increase reward processing overall for adolescents with depression, there seems to be clinical utility in upregulating reward responsiveness. So this has gotten us really interested in, so how do we do that? And so kind of putting the pieces together, how do we teach people to be more responsive to the positive, to potential rewards? And thinking also about that social context and the parent-child relationship and the ways in which positive emotions build in our interactions with each other. And so before we got into um, the intervention piece, we wanted to, for the intervention development, we were wondering, is this even modifiable? Maybe it's a trait-like marker and we can't change it. And so we tested, we um, conducted a brief analog study where we used a motivational manipulation where we prompted participants to think about what they wanted to do with the money that they could win in a monetary reward task why they want to obtain that thing that they're interested in. This was with undergraduate research participants, so it was typically some sort of food that they wanted. And the research assistants really coached them on like, yeah, think about that. Think about how great it'll be to have that after. So increasing the personal salience of the reward and motivation to obtain it. And we found in a randomized study, so we compared that to just a neutral repeating task instructions, that that brief motivational manipulation enhance the reward positivity in undergrads. So this suggests to us this should be modifiable and maybe then with children targeting reward, salience, positive emotions in the context of the parent-child relationship may be particularly relevant for upregulating up positive emotions and reward response. So I'm quickly going to present data from one other recent study from my lab. This is a project led by my postdoc, Kaylin Hill. And again, we are interested in this idea of how social context may shape reward responsiveness and whether um, and how that presents independently of the effect of depression. Is this just a marker of depression? How much is it impacted by interac parent-child interactions? And so this was in a sample of 57 adolescents with major depressive disorder or persistent depressive disorder. It's an overall pretty severely chronically depressed sample. And they reported on their conflict with mothers and fathers. So ideally, we'd like to have measures really of more positive emotions and warmth and structure. Um, but here, we're kind of using this as a proxy of the quality of that relationship. And then also on dimensional depressive symptom severity, we had a broad range. Um, so overall, we had pretty high levels of depression, but there was variability in the self-report measures. And then they completed the EEG, both social and monetary reward tasks. And what we found is that when we look at that reward positivity component, it wasn't just about depressive symptoms blunting reward responsiveness. It was actually the combination of maternal conflict and elevated depressive symptoms were associated with a reduced reward positivity, particularly in that social domain. And so this is looking at the association between depressive symptoms along the x-axis and the y-axis is that reward positivity component. 
And for the, um, for the green line, those are the adolescents who reported a lot of conflict with their moms. And then when they had elevated depre higher depressive symptoms, we saw more blunting of that reward responsiveness. Whereas for those who reported average or low maternal conflict, we don't see this association between depression and reward responsiveness. So again, this suggests to us that, that targeting positive emotions in the context of that parent-child relationship may be particularly relevant for shaping reward responsiveness. And so that leads me then to the intervention that we've been developing. Um, so this is an intervention that we call um, Family Promoting Positive Emotions, or FPPE for short. And we adapted this from Michelle Krask's Positive Affect Treatment Developed for Adults, um, but it's really um, adapted for younger children and parents. So a lot of major changes, although the key kind of components are the same. And we administer this in dyadic sessions with mom, child, and a clinician. It's all been virtual right now. I'll show you a, screen, um, a screenshot, but we actually want to keep it virtual because it does seem to be really helpful for making it accessible and easy, more easy for the families to participate, minimizing burden. And so there are four main components. So one is positive emotion psychoeducation. The next then is, so really typical psychoeducation that we would do in CBT, but really focusing on the positive emotions. What types of positive emotions do you experience? In what context? What are the feelings, thoughts, behaviors that go along with those? Why do we have positive emotions? And we really try to encourage moms and kids to sort of put negative emotions and conflicts and things like that aside and really focus on the positive for this brief um, eight session intervention. So we start with the psychoeducation, then we do some work with individual and dyadic positive activities. So uh, scheduling more positive events, positive activities, both on their own. And so mom is working on increasing positive activities, child's working on increasing positive activities, and also things that they can do together and things that they can do with the rest of the family as well. So that's sort of the, one of the behavioral components. Then we do a lot of work around attending to and savoring the positives. So recognizing the positives that happen throughout the day, even small positives, taking time to really reflect on those and savor them, using our senses to really think about, like, what, remind ourselves what that was like, what that feeling was like, what the smells and tastes and sounds were like, and really enjoying and savoring that. Um, and then also anticipating positives in the same way. So thinking about things in the future that we're looking forward to, that we'll enjoy, and really increasing the salience of those through this kind of deep thinking about what that would be like. And then cultivate, cultivating positivity in the family dynamics through gratitude and love, recognizing things that they're grateful for in their lives, things that they love and appreciate about each other. And so we've developed this intervention um, with my colleague Katie Burkhouse at the University of Illinois at Chicago in the FAM lab. And we've started to test it through a virtual platform. And our idea is that we want to see if we can increase reward responsiveness with these neural measures. And if we are able to do that in children, does that then have clinical outcomes? We don't have data yet on whether we, do, we can change the reward processing component, but we do have some very preliminary data on the intervention that I'll show you. Um, another thing I'll quickly say about the intervention is that it was designed to be really engaging and really fun in the session too. So we have these really fun workbooks with a hedgehog and other little creatures who are the mascots and help to teach the skills through concrete examples. Um, we also start each session with a fun game or riddles or jokes, uh, um, and we do a lot of rewards in the session, a lot of positive feedback to make it a fun, enjoyable thing. And so this is a screenshot um, from a Zoom session with, um, with one of our families, and you can see they're not driving, they are parked, um, but they are just between, sport, after sports practice, they're able to log on to their session, and they're having fun, and they enjoy it, and I'll share some quotes, too, about how the people um, enjoy it overall. So I have a, an audio clip of this child, and in this situation, he's anticipating positives and really trying to think about the details of that. Like, what are the things that he's going to look forward to and enjoy? And it's around eating an ice cream cone. So a simple, um, positive thing to, um, to enjoy. So I'll play the clip of him describing that. It was 
I would see the cone. Mm -hmm. I would taste the, like the, is there ice cream in the cone? Yeah, mm -hmm. there probably is. Yeah. I would taste the ice cream and the crunchiness of the cone. Mm -hmm. I would hear the crunchiness and if people are talking, the talking. Mm -hmm. And I would feel maybe a napkin if they gave it to me or the the fluffy skin. Smell. Yeah. Smell the ice cream. Yeah, so that's an example of really taking time to notice these things that we often take for granted. We probably usually don't think a lot about like what we're experiencing with that ice cream cone, but really taking time to savor the positives and to think about and reflect on the positives. And so our data on this are very preliminary. Um, but we are seeing evidence that it seems to be effective, at least in terms of clinical outcomes. And so this is in a small sample of five mothers with depression and anhedonia and their never depressed children. And um, this is through Dr. Katie Burkhouse's work, and they had previously completed a psychoeducation depression prevention intervention. And what we found is that when they did the psychoeducation condition, they, um, the child's anhedonia symptoms increase um, from pre to post treatment. So these are high risk kids. These are families also that have a lot of stress in their families, a lot of things going on. Um, and so they're high risk and they're showing an increase in symptoms over even relatively short amounts of time. But these same families, when they did the FPPE intervention, their antidonia actually decreased from um, pre to post. So very preliminary, but provides some support for this idea that enhancing positive emotions in the context of mother-child relationships may be effective in reducing risk for symptoms in children at high risk for depression. There's still a lot of other things to look at in terms of can, does it change reward responsiveness? Is that a mechanism of effects for children? And then there's also all sorts of implications in terms of thinking about parent clinical outcomes. Is this effective as an add-on to CBT for depression in parents, for example. So a lot of things to do. So um, we're also seeing, getting really positive feedback from families. They do really like it. It's fun. They learn um, new skills in, in an enjoyable way. So these are just a few quotes. I learn new ways to look at my daughter and know when she's happy. So that's one thing we really focus on too, is like, how do we read each other's emotions in terms of that positive content and how do, and positive emotions and how do we, how do, does one person's positive emotion influence the other? The exercises help us have fun and bond together. I felt so happy and nice with today's lessons. So lastly, just quick conclusions. Low, um, low reward responsiveness appears to reflect a vulnerability for depression when we think it's shaped in part by social context and parent-child relationships are a very important or a developmental social context. And reward responsiveness doesn't seem to be enhanced by standard interventions, but we think it can be targeted by more directly increasing motivation and reward salience, um, potentially through dyadic interventions that target positive emotions, reward responsiveness, and motivation in the context of mother-child interactions. And it's possible in doing so that we could um, mitigate later symptoms in children at risk for depression. And we don't think that this is like the solution to depression prevention, but it could be an effective add-on intervention for families where there's evidence of low reward, low um, positive emotions. And I'd like to thank my lab and the funders of this work. Thank you all. Good afternoon, I'm Jessica Schwartzman, and I'm really excited to be with you guys. I have to say this is, full disclosure, my first time at ADAA, and so um, it's been a really fun and positive experience coming from the autism world and crossing over and getting to meet with um, experts in uh, areas that I'm really passionate about. And thank you to Alex for the invitation to join this. Um, I hope that the population I care a lot about is also one that gets folks thinking about how you might see some of our kids pop up in your settings, both clinically and in research. Research. So my work is um, focused on exploring parent and adolescent outcomes during um, an autism adapted CBT protocol that we've done here at Vanderbilt um, and really looking at depression in autistic adolescents. So in terms of disclosures, um, I just have some of the funding listed up here and I don't have any other financial disclosures. Um, so to give a little bit of a background, 
this is probably a population I don't have to tell much about what autism is, but just as a refresher, uh, we really think about it as a neurodevelopmental, so again, a pervasive through the lifespan profile that's characterized by both social communication and interaction difficulties. And then this other piece around these circumscribed, really restricted, narrowed interests, and sometimes what we often see as restricted, repetitive behaviors. Um, autism is highly prevalent. It occurs across the world. I'll focus specifically on the U.S. A recent CDC report came out that one in 44 children will be diagnosed annually in the United States with autism. I recognize that autism is a spectrum, which I think makes it fantastic. So many of the ways that kids present might look different depending on each child. So we know that the autistic community is growing and is becoming more prevalent. We also know that adolescent depression is also on the rise. This is an estimate that 17% of adolescents in the US experience depression. This is before the COVID pandemic. So naturally, as we all know, the rates have continued to increase. So from a global health perspective, we're seeing both increased prevalence both in autism and adolescent depression. I'm really interested in the intersection of these two pieces. So what we know is that autistic adolescents are twice as likely to experience depression as their non-autistic peers. Again, thinking about a large cohort who's gonna be experiencing depression. Even more concerning, one in four autistic adolescents experience suicidal thoughts before age 18. One in 10 actually attempt suicide in a very serious and lethal way before they turn 18. This crowd knows that a very salient predictor of future attempts is previous attempts. So if one in 10 children are attempting suicide, this is gonna be a high needs population. It's probably not surprising that I think about autistic adolescents being a significant, a prevalent, and really at risk population that many folks feel unprepared to serve. So um, what I'll talk about uh, kind of I guess a spoiler alert, we don't have a lot of research in the world of depression and autism, but we have fantastic work done in non-autistic youth. So I'll start there. When we look to the literature largely um, in non-autistic populations, we know that cognitive behavioral therapy is kind of a leading intervention for depression in non-autistic adolescents. So this can kind of fill a gap in the fact that we don't know a lot about risk and resilience factors to depression and autism, and even less treatment research is available to guide many of us who don't have time to wait years for high quality research. We also know from non-autistic adolescents with depression that both parent and adolescent factors can affect many aspects of CBT, not only from who accesses it, who engages with it, and the various outcomes that we see. So I like this picture uh, that I included because I think that there's many different pathways to the same outcome of recovery and well-being being the central target that we're all focused on. I think we don't know a lot about the pathway in autism, but I'm hoping that some of the work that we will do will continue to help us understand what that pathway might look like. Um, so there's been one small randomized control trial, 10 in the waitlist group, 10 in the active group for standard CBT, and it wasn't effective. Kind of shocking that there's only been one study on depression and autism, given that it's such a highly prevalent population with high psychiatric needs. What we know though is that stakeholder guidance, particularly from autistic self-advocates with the lived experience of depression and suicide, can really guide us both as clinicians and researchers to fill a lot of the gaps and ultimately pave the way to understand what the pathway might look in autism towards recovery and well-being. Um, the last kind of piece to note that I think is, is really promising is that autism adapted CBT consistently outperforms standard CBT for anxiety and OCD. And there's really great literature from Jeff Wood's team, from Susan White, from Eric Storch, Phil Kendall, a lot of people have looked into this and shown that autism adapted, C, adapted CBT consistently outperforms standard. So naturally it kind of begs the question, if that's true for anxiety and OCD, it might also be true for depression. Challenges is that nobody's actually developed an autism adapted depression protocol and tried to use it with autistic adolescents. So that's where a lot of my work comes in. 
So I'll briefly talk the three objectives um, for this current study is first looking at um, the preliminary efficacy. I also have some feasibility and acceptability data on autism adapted CBT for depression in reducing depression scores in our autistic cohort. Second, a lot of my work is also in the parent experience, so um, I'll talk a little bit about that. The second aim is to look at caregiver experiences and their outcomes as their child moves through the program. The third and final one is starting to look at both adolescent and caregiver perceptions of their dyadic interactions, particularly as they move through the program. Uh, so here's a little bit of a snapshot I'll kind of introduce you, that's our flyer. Um, so we have an autism adapted group CBT protocol. The reason that we chose group, um, we have some pilot data looking at individual CBT compared to our groups, and we see faster gains in shorter periods of time from group. If you think about autistic adolescents having social challenges, it is a really nice effect, what we think so far, of being in a group that's validating and full of other teens that are like you going through something similar. So it is kind of interesting that we're starting to see a faster response in terms of depression in our group format than we do individual, but that's to be explored. So for this program, um, we have 12 adolescent groups that are 90 minutes, so a relatively short treatment dosage. We also have six concurrent but separate caregiver sessions that are about an hour. And I'm going to talk about why um, it's optional and I think some of the pros and also some of the cons to that piece in some of this work. The three general modules that we focus on, and I'll talk about the autism adaptations in a second, we work on emotion, recognition, and regulation a lot in the beginning, and I'll talk about why, thinking about the autism phenotype. We talk about cognitive distortions and restructuring, particularly around the autism identity. What do I think about autism and a lot of the stigma that I'm gonna experience at school and out in the community related to autism. And then the last one is relationship skills. We got a lot of feedback on this piece from our stakeholders about how important it is, particularly in the context of middle school and high school. Um, so I've been very fortunate to work with a really dedicated group of stakeholders. Um, it's comprised of four autistic adults with the lived experience of depression. Um, we have two parents of autistic youth, um, and I also have an autistic clinical researcher who's really interested in this work. So this is a group that meets pretty regularly to talk about some of the challenges in adapting and meeting the needs for this population. Um, so we have some of the autism adaptations in our group program here that's guided a lot by stakeholder input. I won't have time to go over each of them, but some of the ones I'm going to highlight is really in integrating the circumscribed interest. Again, that's a diagnostic criteria of autism, really using that piece of the phenotype into the CBT content that we use in order to make the material more relevant and engaging. Um, some of the other things is we talk a lot about alexithymia. About 75% of autistic adolescents have high scores on alexithymia measures. So starting CBT with how we're feeling is going to be a lot more challenging if you have a population that doesn't know how to identify and then communicate what they're feeling. So we really make emotions concrete and formulaic equations to understand what am I feeling and then how do I tell somebody else I'm feeling that. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about study design. Right now it's a pilot, non-randomized trial, so just um, inviting folks in that uh, meet. We give study measures before, so at week zero, during at the midpoint, which is week six, and at the end of the program at week 12. A little bit about the study eligibility. So the inclusion criteria is having a diagnosis of autism, uh, middle school and high school students. English speaking, right now the materials and the measures are validated for individuals without an intellectual disability, so autistic adolescents with a full-scale IQ at or above 70. They have to be willing to attend sessions and have a caregiver involved. Um, the exclusion criteria, as I mentioned, is um, the materials and the measures are not designed for youth with intellectual disability. It's also challenging if any youths have an uncontrolled medical condition that might threaten their safety in a group setting. Also any aggression to self or others naturally and youth that present with severe suicidality that would require higher level care before joining the groups. So far we've graduated two groups with 13 adolescents. The average age is about 15 years old. Um, we had seven cisgender male, three cisgender female, and three gender non-binary adolescents graduate the program. 
Uh, so for the first aim, looking at just the preliminary efficacy of the program, we use the revised children's anxiety and depression scale. Both the caregiver and the adolescent self-report has been validated in autistic samples, so it's a really nice measure. The second aim is looking at caregivers' own experiences. So this is collecting things like the PHQ-9, the GAD-7, um, a stress measure, resilience, and quality of life, just to see what parents' experiences are like as they and their child move through the program. And then the last one is just starting to kind of dip into this idea of how parents and caregivers view each other and aspects of their relationship as they move through the program. Because it's pilot, pilot, I don't have super fancy statistics other than just looking at within uh, subjects t-test scores of the baseline to midpoint, so week zero to week six, also looking at um, week zero baseline to week 12. I don't include midpoint, so week six to week 12, because there aren't any significant changes, and I don't have 10. So um, in terms of feasibility and acceptability, we have um, attrition is 87% of youth who enrolled in the program completed it. So 13 of 15 have graduated, all 12 sessions. Um, one terminated prematurely due to a family move out of state, and then another child graduated to a higher level of care due to higher suicidality. In terms of outcome data collection, um, we've had 100% data completion at baseline, midpoint, and post. In terms of engagement, 87% of adolescents have attended at least 10 of the 12 sessions, gaining what we consider the full benefit of the program. Uh, in the table down here, I don't have a cursor, um, but I've listed, again, some of the acceptability metrics from both the adolescent and caregiver perspective. So we see that both adolescents and caregivers are pretty satisfied with the program. Uh, we also ask uh, adolescents uh, their likelihood of using certain skills moving forward, and as well as their caregiver's perception of that, and we see that they're likely. Um, it's a scale one to five, five being very likely, and one is not at all. <laughs> Um, in terms of program recommendation, both um, adolescents and their caregivers rate it very highly likely to recommend it to another family or teen. Um, and then interestingly, kind of the groups of skills that teens find most important are cognitive restructuring skills and relationship skills, while the caregivers tend to think that the emotion recognition and regulation skills and relationship skills are the most helpful. So to show you a little bit of the pilot data, this is our first aim, again, looking at change in adolescent depression during the program. So this is 13 adolescents that have graduated. We're looking at both caregiver and adolescent report. Um, a lot of my early work shows that um, not only do we have non-significant reliability between the two raters, but they tend to not have any strength of agreement either. So we're looking at a lot of different perspectives. What you'll see on the graph are T-scores, so this is the depression subscale of the RCADs, looking at caregiver ratings, which are in, should be gold, um, and then adolescent ratings in black. Again, um, the first measurement point being baseline before they start the program, midpoint at week six, and post at week 12. So when we look from the adolescent perspective, again, the black bar, we see a pretty big drop off um, in depression scores from the baseline to the midpoint time area, about 10 T scores. So we're seeing that this is statistically significant and also clinically meaningful that our kids are um, endorsing a pretty significant reduction in depression. Interestingly, we don't see any significant changes in caregiver ratings of adolescent depression, especially if you look at the differences between the midpoints. Uh, the gap is pretty big, and so we're trying to, again, some of the work we're doing on the side is figuring out what are the differences, what are parents seeing that kids are not seeing, and vice versa. In terms of the second aim, um, this is just poking at changes in parent outcomes themselves. So parent ratings of their own depression symptoms, anxiety, distress, stress, quality of life, and um, resilience. And we don't see any significant change in caregiver outcomes as they and their kid participate in the program. Uh, okay, so this will be aim three, looking just a little bit at perceptions of dyadic interaction. So I'll start with the caregivers. Um, let's cut off, sorry about that. Um, this is looking at the parenting stress index, which is a large kind of uh, parenting stress index that has really nice subscales that look at different components of dyadic interactions. And what we see is that total parenting stress, parents' personal distress, and their perception of dysfunctional interactions don't change over the intervention. But what we see is a 10 percentile decrease 
in caregivers' perceptions of how difficult their child is to manage and live with on a day-to-day -day basis. So parents might not be seeing a depression reduction in the same way their adolescents are, but they are starting to notice that their child is having less difficulty, less problematic, not only from a personal perspective, but it has items related to the family context. Um, so this is uh, adolescents' perceptions of their parents' emotional availability, and we don't see any change um, over the 12-week program in what adolescents think of how available their parent is to support them in a time of need, how understanding they are of their experience. We don't see any changes from the program in this area. So to quickly summarize, what we think is that CBT um, adapted for autistic adolescents with depressions might be effective for treating depression in youth, but only according to their self-report. Um, some of the things that we know from our early work is that there's a lot of discrepancy between the ratings, um, and so that's going to continue to compl complicate <laughs> our measurement and intervention efforts, so continuing to think through how can we resolve those discrepancies to have maybe a cleaner estimate. We know that the early work shows that participation in this group model is not associated with significant changes in parent outcomes. We think that this is a link to the fact that the caregiver sessions are optional. Um, so we made them virtual and we had kind of an add-on component with them, but they weren't core to the intervention. Um, we're hoping that by some of the preliminary work that we found that we can build out a more concurrent separate session where parents have um, more training themselves. Lastly, we think that the intervention um, may change caregivers' perceptions of how difficult their child experience is at the moment, um, but it might not affect other areas of adolescent and caregiver perceptions of their dyadic interactions. So future directions, um, doing a randomized control trial, really interested in an active control condition to um, not overestimate treatment effects that can sometimes happen from wait lists. Um, we want to have an active, more care consistent caregiver component. 100% um, of the 13 parents said they wanted their own sessions, um, which is probably not surprising. So that'll be a need that we'll be addressing moving forward. Also integrating more multi-method measurements. Again, we're seeing changes from an adolescent perspective, but thinking about what are clinical ratings, um, behavioral coding, neural measures, and things like that to have more sensitive measurement. And the last, thinking about moderators and mediators of treatment and response. Lastly, I just want to acknowledge um, my research team funding and different collaborators and people that have inspired my work along the way. Thank you. I don't know if there's any questions, but Great. Well, thank you all so much again for attending this late in the day, uh, late in the conference session. If there are any other questions for any of the presenters, um, feel free to ask or come and talk to us afterwards. But otherwise, just want to say thank you all so much for attending, and I hope you all enjoyed these really wonderful talks. Thanks.